Hey, what's up? So today we're talking about high learnings. Okay, so we've covered inguinal hernias. We did femoral hernias, kind of threw that in. Also did ventral hernias. So now we're stuck with hiatal hernia. If you look at the board entirely, you can see that it's completely different. A hiatal hernia versus a ventral hernia. Is a hiatal hernia a hernia? Yes. But it's different because it doesn't come out the abdominal wall. So you pretty much don't have any abdominal wall symptoms. You don't get hiatal hernias from making incisions in your belly. They usually come from either being over, overweight or you have some congenital abnormality of your diaphragm where the crua or the little muscles on the side of the diaphragm are not as strong as they should be. So you end up with part of your stomach in your chest. The simplest explanation of a hiatal hernia is your stomach which is supposed to live in your abdominal cavity is no longer in your abdominal cavity. The top part of it or the GE junction, the gastroesophageal junction is in your chest. When you have a negative pressure system like your chest and you have your stomach, which is a positive pressure or zero pressure area, that's where it lives. When you put in a negative pressure, that GE junction no longer works. Your esophagus, squeezes one, two, three, four, food goes down into your belly. That's why you can drink beer or any other liquid standing on your head. Once it gets into your stomach, the GE junction opens and closes and allows that fluid to go through. When that valve is up in your chest, it is completely open all the time. So what happens is food, one, two, three, four, squeezes down, gets in your stomach and has the ability to come back up. It comes back up if you lean over, it comes back up if you eat a lot of fatty foods, if you drink a lot of sodas. So that kind of stuff will play into symptoms when we talk about resolving it, how to do it, some lifestyle modifications. But first, how do you figure out if you have a hiatal hernia? The first thing you start thinking about are symptoms. Remember, we talked about ventral hernia. We understand those symptoms versus a hiatal hernia, completely different set of symptoms. Reflux. Retrograde flow of the stomach contents back into the esophagus. And again, this is because of the GE junction is not working like it's supposed to, either because it's a bad GE junction or it's just not in the right place. Dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, is when you try to get something down and it won't quite go down or it feels like it's not going down like it's supposed to, that can be to a couple of things. It could be to something called esophageal motility problems where your esophagus is not squeezing like it's supposed to so stuff goes down or when you eat 20-30 minutes later food comes back up and you get choked. Heartburn is that acid bitter taste that comes back up. The bitter taste is the result of the acid getting into your esophagus because your esophagus is not designed to handle acid. It is designed to pulse food into the stomach. If you have really bad reflux, you can develop nausea. Nausea is one of those symptoms that is also seen in a bad gallbladder. So sometimes patients come in saying, I have a hiatal hernia, I get nauseated when I eat, I throw up, and sometimes I have abdominal pain. That's when you need to start thinking that they may actually have a bad gallbladder and not reflux. And odinophagia, fancy, fancy doctor talk for pain when you swallow. Traditionally, that is something that occurs like when you drink something too hot or if you drink something that causes you severe pain when it's going down or also sometimes when it's coming back up. So now if you've looked at all of these symptoms and you say, okay, I think I have reflux, you then go see your GI doctor or your surgeon, you have to figure out whether or not you do have reflux. And there are a couple tests that we do to help make that determination. The first one is a barium swallow or an upper GI. That's where you drink a chalky substance and we watch it go down. It tells us a couple things. It tells us one, whether your esophagus is squeezing like it's supposed to. So you have that one, two, three, four, as opposed to one, four, three, two. If you have this coordinated swallowing mechanism, that is an esophageal motility problem. 
A second option is an upper endoscopy or EGD. An EGD looks at the structural anatomy of your stomach and your esophagus. So one, it looks to see if you've had bad esophagitis or irritation of your stomach, uh, irritation of your esophagus, excuse me, or gastritis. So we look in the inside of the stomach. Once we blow the stomach up, we can look and see if there is a small, medium, or large hiatal hernia. A lot of times you can see a hiatal hernia or a parasophageal hernia at the time of the endoscopy. We will go over parasophageal hernias versus hiatal hernias at a later date. The repair for them is pretty much the same with a few tricks thrown in. What manometry does is, again, gives you better information about your esophagus. You can see things on the barium swallow, but the manometry is a measurement of that phenomena. We can also diagnose things like achalasia or some other abnormalities of the esophagus that you may or may not see on barium swallow. Bravo probe or some type of acid determining test. What you need to do once you do the EGD is figure out if someone has reflux or not. Reflux has a certain measurable criteria that is associated with it. Um, there's something called a Demeester score that tells us how bad your reflux is. Anything greater than 14 is abnormal. We also look at the amount of time that your esophagus is exposed to an abnormal pH. If you have acidity in your esophagus greater than 4% at a time, then you by definition have reflux. Once we've confirmed that diagnosis and have decided, hey, you do have reflux, most people say, well, okay, is this where you jump to surgery? No, this is not where you jump to surgery. The average person has about one episode of reflux a week all the time. That's why PPIs are probably one of the most prescribed medications in the United States. There are small things that you can do before you get on a proton pump inhibitor. This is Nexium. This is Prilosec. Um, Zantac is an H2 blocker um, or Mylanta. People take all kinds of things to reduce the amount of acid in their esophagus so they don't have that burning sensation, that reflux that we always describe. But there are a couple of lifestyle things that you can do prior to that point. Trigger foods like sodas, like ice cream, they can cause your GE junction to malfunction, which puts you at a higher risk of reflux. The other thing is not eating at 10 o'clock at night and then going laying down. The food sometimes is just going to run into your esophagus and cause you to have reflux. A good rule of thumb is don't eat past 7 p.m. That gives you the ability to get in bed by 9. That also works with weight gain as well. Head elevation when you are sleeping also helps. So you'll hear people say, I put two pillows under my bed at night or I put bricks under my bed to help with my reflux. Eating small meals. So instead of eating three huge meals a day or two huge meals a day or five huge meals a day, eat six smaller meals. So decrease the amount of food that you put in your stomach, that decreases the amount of acid that can reflux back into your esophagus. Smoking is a big cause of reflux. Smoking kind of messes up just about everything, but with reflux, people who smoke have worse reflux. Common thing, if they stop smoking, the majority of the time, their reflux goes away. This has to do with the mechanism of nicotine, but it also has to do with the fact that they're coughing all the time. So every time you cough, you're expelling stuff out of your lungs. So what's happening is, you're also pulling stuff up into your stomach. I mean, from your stomach into your esophagus. The last one, lose weight. I, I like the way that this sounds, but realistically lose weight. A large abdomen puts more pressure on your stomach. So it's not a matter of whether or not your GE junction can handle or is work, handle the pressure is working. At certain point, a big belly pushes so much stuff when you eat back into your esophagus that it's going to fail. This is also a reason that people who have a fundiplication have to be a BMI less than 35. 
anybody with a large abdomen, no matter which operation you do, they're going to have continued reflux because of the weight of their abdomen. If none of this works, then you skip to the PPIs, the antacids, um, Nexium protonics. This works pretty well. There's no routine time for you to have a repeat EGD. So let's say you get diagnosed with reflux by a Bravo probe or some type of acid reflux procedure to determine you have reflux and you don't need a repair and you do PPIs. Some people say you need to be on there once, get a scope once a year, two years, five years. Really just follow up with the physician that does your scopes and y'all kind of work out a plan as to whether or not this needs to be done frequently. The one thing that you're looking for is to make sure you don't develop Barrett's esophagitis, which eventually can turn into esophageal cancer. As far as how all of this works, we'll go over anatomy a little bit, and that will allow us to kind of transition into which operation is which. So essentially your lungs are here, your diaphragm is right here, and the GE junction occurs two to four centimeters below the diaphragm. So it's a little valve right here. When your stomach blows up, that valve closes off a little bit, but it can close off because it's in this zero pressure zone. If you have a large abdomen and you're pushing down, you're essentially, every time you call for a move, if you have an extra 50 pounds on your belly, you're pushing food back up, and that's why reflux doesn't work. Also remember, in the lungs, you have a negative pressure system, so stuff, because your lungs have to fill up and down, is always moving up and down. So food, once it gets into your esophagus, moves up, and that's why you get the bitter taste. As far as the operations, there are three operations that we talk about with reflux. Kind of exaggerated here. So what happens is we have to recreate a valve. So we first look at your diaphragm and we mobilize everything so we have that two to four centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus. Once you have that two to four centimeters, you have enough length so that you separate your new valve and you replace and you put the old valve in the right position. Once you do that, this is where the drawing will get a little tricky, but I'll hopefully get you a good image. You wrap this greater curve of your stomach around the top of your esophagus. So what happens is you then have a streamlined appearance of your stomach that looks like this. And then you'll have part of your stomach here wrapped around and it comes completely across. So think of it as now when you eat something, your belly fills up. When your belly fills up, it tightens that stomach. So that squeezes down that GE junction. So that's called a Nissen fundiplication. And Nissen fundiplication is essentially a 360 degree wrap. If someone has difficulty swallowing, so they have a small component of a esophageal dysmotility or some type of disorder, and they can't tolerate a full Nissen, we then think about doing a toupee. A toupee is a 270 degree wrap. So it allows your esophagus to squeeze stuff a little more through, but at the same time gives you enough of a swelling around that GE junction to work. If you look at a, a toupee, what happens instead of suturing in the midline, you have a suture line here and a suture line here to the side of the esophagus. So what happens is that anterior 90 degrees is open but you have stomach on this side, this side, and posterior. That's a 270. There is something called a door that is a 180 degree wrap. A door is a little different. A door is used for esophageal motility problems called achalasia. Achalasia is basically your GE junction is squeezed too much, so you have to open it up. When you open it up, you end up creating a space for reflux. That door covers that myotomy or that opening of the esophagus to protect it while also offering some reflux protection. 
Some people like doing a toupee, so they kind of open that myotomy up if they can't complete a good myotomy. But again, that's getting way deep into surgery. There are plenty of surgery videos on the channel. So with our suggestions, you can either do a Nissen, a toupee, or a door. Pretty much 90% of the time we do a Nissen fund application. The other time we do a toupee. That pretty much covers reflux. Now, the other thing that you want to talk about is the hiatal hernia. I still kind of haven't addressed it. The hiatal hernia repair is done in two fashions. One is when you do that wrap for the stomach and you've mobilized that part of your intra-abdominal esophagus, what you've done is move the GE junction like it's supposed to so you no longer have your GE junction up in your chest. And what happens is, if you look at it, it looks like this. So essentially, your esophagus comes down and your GE junction is here and it's blue and you have this wrapping it. So the food comes down and it wraps. This full wrap is a Nissen, a wrap where you can see it is a toupee. And if you just lay part of it on top of it, that's a door. Now, as far as that defect in the hiatus, so what happens now is you have the right and left crew on this side. And again, this is a three-dimensional picture, but the esophagus is basically coming through a hole. And what we're doing is putting stitches to tighten that up. So it normally looks like this when you have a hiatal hernia, when you finish, I'll turn it this way. It normally looks like this. When we finish, it's almost kissing the esophagus so that it does two things. One, food is not going to come back up because you don't have that space and it doesn't allow this to slide. Two, because you have that wrap, that wrap actually helps prevent your stuff from going in and out. So putting stitches around to reapproximate that hiatal hernia fixes it. And then the wrap helps add bulk to that GE junction so it doesn't slide up. So that's how we fix a hiatal hernia. Again, not an abdominal wall thing. It's a stomach esophagus diaphragm issue. That pretty much covers all of the hernias except for weird obturator hernias and hernias in the pelvis or flank hernias and other things but the principles to fix them are all the same hope this answers just about every her question you have about hernias in general again if you have some questions dm them to me on instagram or put them in the comments below we'll get them answered and we'll try and kind of cover some of these topics, like how do you do a Nissen fund application. We'll get into some of that stuff later, but again, there are great videos on the channel already. If something comes up, let us know. We'll get you uh, taken care of. Hope this explains everything. Y'all take care.